My name is Associate Professor David M. Scott. For those who you don't know who I am, I'm President of the Australian Society of Anaesthetists. And I'd like to welcome you to the 77th Annual National Scientific Congress of the Australian Society of Anaesthetists here in Adelaide. I'd just like to do a statement of acknowledgement. Uh, the ASA acknowledges that the land we meet on today is the traditional lands for the Ghana people and that we respect their spiritual relationship with their country. We also acknowledge the Ghana people as the traditional custodians of the Adelaide region and their cultural and heritage beliefs are still important to the living Ghana people today. The 2018 NSC theme is centred around quality and outcomes, patient blood management and pain, and I'm sure that the convener, Dr Simon Macklin, and his team will ensure that the boundaries are not only pushed out academically, but also in a range of other exciting activities outside of the lecture theatre. The entire program is very stimulating, and I hope that you will make the best of your trip to Adelaide. It gives me great pleasure to introduce the 2018 NSC convener, Dr Simon Macklin, to the stage. <clears throat> Thank you, David. Professor, President, Directors and Council of the ASA, distinguished guests, invited speakers, delegates, accompanying partners, industry, exhibitors, and above all, friends, we welcome you to Adelaide, to this, the 77th rendition edition of the NSC. The credit for what the next four days has to offer goes without question of doubt to the members of the team who have put this program together. Next slide. The scientific convener, Kate Drummond, has assembled a really exciting program that offers something for everyone. Treasurer Piers Robertson has been a huge support. Workshops have been coordinated by Johanna Sonfleth. Masterclasses and small group discussions by Min Chi Lee. There have been over 100 people involved in delivering these components of the meeting, from subcommittee members to facilitators and helpers. And without your involvement and support, the NSC would not be the event that it is. You are too many to, well, to, to mention by name, but I give you my heartfelt thanks. The social program is always an important component of the meeting, and I appreciate the lengths that Laura Willington and Chris Usher have gone to, and I look forward to tonight's gala dinner with great anticipation. It promises to be a fabulous evening. We have resurrected the art exhibition and I'm grateful for those who have submitted their work for display. Anesthesia is an art form. We are simply displaying the art forms that other people practice outside of their theatre time. Chen Wei Xiong has done a great job in curating this exhibition, and I hope you will enjoy what there is on offer. The trainees are without question our future. And our trainee representatives, Cheryl Choi and Nicole Diaka Michaelis, have assembled an excellent program for our trainees, covering a broad range of topics that I think are pertinent to the trainee group. A huge vote of thanks goes to Munib Kiani, who has willingly taken on whatever tasks we have asked him to do. Our designated charity is once again Lifebox. We're following the initiative of previous recent meetings to donate funds allocated to satchels and speaker gifts to this cause. In addition, if you visit the Anesthesia Continuing Education booth, you'll find a wine wall. Buy into the Lucky Dip and you'll walk away with a bottle of fine South Australian wine. For those true connoisseurs, there are three bottles, sensational wines, that are up for grabs in a silent auction, with all the proceeds from this wine wall going to Lifebox. The wall will close on Sunday afternoon, uh, and so that we can announce uh, the winners of the silent auction before people disappear if they need to go on Sunday evening. I encourage you to download the app, load your profile by using your registration password, and organize your schedule. I ask you to direct questions to the session chairs through this app. Finally, 
In one month's time, 100 years ago, the guns on the Western Front were silenced. This heralded the end of the Great War. The poppy has come to symbolize the sacrifice made by many, the ultimate sacrifice made in the service of their country. We honor them by including the poppy in our logo. It's fitting that we have a military president, and it is no coincidence that our Kester Brown narration will be delivered by Air Vice Marshal Tracy Smart, Surgeon General of the Australian Defence Force. So without further ado, I wish you well. I hope you enjoy the next few days and the Adelaide ASA National Scientific Congress. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Uh, as part of coming to Adelaide, uh, we have a welcome to country. I'd like to introduce Uncle Mugi, uh, Major Sumner, member of the Order of Australia for Services to the Indigenous Community, uh, an elder medicine man and healer. Major Mugi, Mugi Sumner, known affectionately as Uncle Mugi, is an elder and medicine man who has taken us on a journey of, who will take us on a journey of ceremony, dance and song and he will discuss the traditional ways of his people and the importance of our connection to the land. In 2010, Australia was facing the worst drought in recorded history. At the end of the river on the Coorong, uh, Uncle Mugi grew tired of watching his ancestral home die and so united a group of different Aboriginal river nations in a 2,300 kilometre pilgrimage to dance the spirit back into the river and into themselves. By the time they had finished, the drought had broken and what followed was the wettest season in living memory with floods throughout the basin. Grand Master of Traditional Australian Native Martial Arts. Although his work in this field has been given little recognition in Australia, Uncle Mugi is affectionately known as, uh, sorry, has earned great respect with other martial arts masters from around the world and Uncle Mugi is widely acknowledged as the Grand Master of traditional Australian native martial arts. Uncle Mugi understands the importance of preserving and passing on his culture. He believes that teaching people to look at their culture and their past helps them to feel the spirit within. He works to preserve his culture by passing on his teachings and stories of his people. The Naranjindi are people, are an Aboriginal nation which inhabits the Lower Murray, Coorong, and the Lakes area of South Australia. I welcome Uncle Mugi to the stage to perform Welcome to Our Country. Thank you. Thank you for that. With my people, I travelled to many parts of the world. I teach, I encourage, but I also encourage other people, don't forget who you are. Practice your culture, whoever you are, where you come from. Culture is in our genes, it's in our spirit. It connects us to different parts of the world, it connects us to the to the stars. Our stories go back thousands and thousands of years. To look at who we are, how long we lived in this country. We traveled across, and as you walk in today, you've traveled across a lot of places that's connected to culture, connected to ceremony. A lot of places that we don't even know about. How many people walk across that little path for the past 40 to 50 to 100,000 years? What happened in that path? Who lived there? What ceremonies were practiced? The ceremony today before you start the conference, I'd like to invite our ancestors here to be with us. 
my ancestors, your ancestors, wherever you come from in the world. I'd like to invite them here to be, to come here and sit amongst you, to help you make decisions on, on your job. And I know your job. I've had a bit of experience with a few times I've been to hospital. I know what you do. How you make people feel comfortable. How you talk to them. And then you have to do your job, you put them to sleep. So all of that, the, you have to make the right decisions. You have to make sure that everything that's written down is, is right for that person. So I'd like your ancestors to be here with you, to help you, to help us. Walkandi Ngariri Pakanamotano, Ngariri Pangari, Lewan Gana Rui 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 What I said in my language, I asked the ancestors from the four directions to come here, to sit down in the land of the Ghana people. The song was to welcome them, to welcome my ancestors, welcome your ancestors, but also it was to welcome you to the land of the Ghana people. And on behalf of my mother's people, the Ghana people, I welcome you to, to, the, to her land, to my land. I welcome you here and enjoy yourself while you're here. And I know you will because your ancestors will be here with you to look after you and see you safely back home. Thank you very much. Thank you, Uncle Mugi, for the most honourable welcome to your country. Um, I'm sure we'll all enjoy our time here. If you could bring up the next slide. Um, and for those of you who have uh, QR code readers, grab your phones out now. Um, this is the official launch of the Long Lives and Healthy Workplaces project, which the ASA has been working with the region, uh, sorry, the uh, well, wellness of an Easter special interest group over the last 12 months. Um, we now have on the website, open access to anyone who wants to use it, a complete and comprehensive package looking at 
uh, how individuals, departments and groups can improve their wellness within the community of anaesthesia. Uh, you can note down the website as well. Uh, if you don't have either of those, if you just go to ASA, uh, Google ASA Wellness, it should come up. It is freely accessible. You don't need to log on to have access to it. That website will give you uh, a toolkit which you can download or which you can take to your department and work through, which will help, we believe, uh, everyone managing their day-to-day -day lives and dealing with the stresses that we offer encounter in our job. Uh, it is a comprehensive package and has been pulled together by an organisation called Every Mind, which used to be the Hunter Institute of Mental Health. They've done a lot of work with the mining industry uh, and this project is quite comprehensive. So I'm talking a bit while you can all copy down or take a photo or, or read the code because I really encourage every one of you to go and have a look at this site and take it back to your departments wherever you work and say, let's do this. Because I'm hopeful that by doing this we will be able to look after the mental health of all of our trainees and our colleagues and ourselves much better than we have in the past. This is an important initiative of the Society of Anaesthetists and as my good friend David Kibblewhite said, the reason the society exists is for the people. It is looking after the people, supporting, representing and educating the people that the society exists for. And this is both educating and supporting the people who do anaesthesia. So um, please uh, go to the website yourself or get your department heads to go there and um, engage with this very important progr uh, program. Um, Simon has welcomed us to uh, the conference. I was speaking with the organising committee last night and um, they tell me that the gala dinner has got some extra special monster entertainment for us tonight, so I'm really looking forward to that. Um, and it'll all become apparent when you get there tonight if you're joining us for the gala dinner. I'd also like to draw your attention to the fact that exactly 100 years ago today, the Australian Army Corps was withdrawn from the fighting in France. It was on this day that General Monash's army was pulled back and that the Australians saw the last of their fighting. World War I claimed over 60,000 Australian lives. Um, and it is one of the reasons why every town that you go to will have a war memorial or an honour board, because there have been people from every town in Australia who've served in World War I. So it kind of makes sense that we would acknowledge that with the poppy and also with our opening speaker, Air Vice Marshal Dr Tracy Smart. She's going to deliver the Kester Brown presentation. Her presentation title is Leading Cultural Change. And just a bit about Tracy, or, or as I like to call her, ma'am. Um, she uh, graduated from university here in uh, Adelaide um, as a doctor and then joined the Air Force. She has a list of uh, postnomials longer than the alphabet after her name. I'm not going to try and go through them all. Um, but then uh, she has served as a medical officer in the Royal Australian Air Force since then. And she's had postings... Uh, in Australia, all over Australia, also with the RAF and the US Air Force. She was the first female commanding officer of the Air Force Institute of Aviation Medicine here in Adelaide. Uh, she has deployed on many operational uh, experiences um, and she's also served as commanding officer of the Health Services Wing in which her role, she was in charge of all Air Force health assets in Australia. She then got promoted to Air Commodore and undertook a number of director roles within the Defence Force um, and then was promoted to Air Vice Marshal, which, for those of you who don't understand Air Force ranks, is a two-star general, um, uh, where she now has control of all health, not just Air Force, but all health assets. Um, she is responsible for the division of healthcare... Sorry, the provision of healthcare to the uh, Australian Defence Force and health preparedness for... Australian Defence Force operations. And as Surgeon General of the Australian Defence Force, she is responsible for providing strategic health advice to the ADF and a technical oversight of operational health across the Defence Force. 
Air Vice Marshal Smart was made a member of the Order of Australia in 2012 in the Queen's Birthday Honours List, and importantly, her brother is an anaesthetist. I'd like you to welcome Tracy to the stage. Yes, a brother who's an anaesthetist but wouldn't join the Defence Force because he didn't want to call me ma'am. So, um, look, uh, thank you very much for that introduction. I too would like to uh, acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today, the Ghana people, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. And I'd also like to acknowledge and pay my respects to all current and, and former serving ADF members who are here today and I'd like you to join with me, stand up, join with me in thanking, thanking them for their service. Everybody stand up. As you can see, it's a lot of people. Um, so thanks very much. So um, it was quite uh, fitting that we had the uh, Welcome to Country and, uh, from Uncle Moogie and a talk about culture because that's what I'm going to talk about today. Um, and it's a very <coughs> great privilege to be giving the uh, Kester Brown oration. I didn't know much about uh, this gentleman before I, uh, I got this honour, but I found it, I think uh, he's, he's got a, obviously a list of honours and awards a mile long as well, but what I found interesting is that he sounds like he's a bit of a different um, uh, character as well. Not, not just an anaesthetist, but a, an international man of mystery from the sound of things. Born in, in Africa, educated in Scotland, working in Australia, had military service himself, and as he said himself on a website I read, he's had a very interesting life um, providing teaching around the world but also doing all sorts of other stuff. So I think a person who's had an interesting life, sort of outside the box type of thinking, uh, is the perfect uh, uh, sort of background for this talk, which is a little bit different from the other talks I'm sure that you'll be getting over the next few days. Now, uh, in the Defence Force, we always have to have a scope side slide. We're very regimented, so this is what I'm going to cover. Some general stuff for a start about our culture and what health does in the ADF. Then some three big moments of, of strategic cultural change and how we went through that, and then my own personal reflections about how I'm looking at changing culture within the health services in defence. Some lessons learned and then some thoughts to ponder for you. Um, so the interesting thing about my organisation is that we deliberately put people in harm's way to do our job. And our job uh, is very serious. We defend Australian international interests, or as a former boss of mine said, we deploy lethal force to defeat and deter our enemies. And we should never forget that. It involves high-risk activities, extreme environments, a lot of physical and mental stressors, and often leads to the ultimate sacrifice, um, which, is, uh, which is shown there. So it's very important, therefore, for us to mitigate that risk. And we do that through planning and risk assessment and, and protecting our forces with helmets and, and body armour. Also in the um, normal environment, workplace health, health, work health and safety. But, but ADF Health Services, that's our job as well. We're there to make people as fit as possible to do the job, protect them from disease and from illness while they're serving, and then provide them treatment services when they become unwell. And another mitigator is, I think, the military culture, which is what I'll talk about. But we're doing this to exercise an extreme duty of care that we have on behalf of the nation. So what does military culture look like? Well, I'm sure you've all got some preconceived ideas. It looks a bit like that. And um, it is a disciplined hierarchy organisation. Um, and it needs to be to get that very serious mission done. But it also focuses on the individual. We want our people to be the best of the best, fit and healthy, have positive attitudes and be very motivated, and they are. And we pride ourselves on our strong values, such as honesty, courage and respect. There's a great emphasis on teamwork, that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. And there's a real sense every time we put on the uniform that we're serving our country, even if it's, it's Saturday morning in Adelaide, we're serving our country and there's nothing... Uh, I actually said to a military chaplain's conference, there's no higher calling, and I said, oh, maybe there is, I don't know, but <laughs> for you guys. But, and reputation to us is paramount, not just because it makes us look good, because it actually affects national security. So if you undermine faith in the faith and defence force, you undermine national security. And we also need to be an attractive employer to get those best and brightest and to be a cross-section of Australia. Now, there's also, um, as well as the overall military culture, there are a lot of... Um, different cultures in the single services. And I seem to be having problems with this. I'm not sure if it's me or if I'm pointing it in the wrong direction. Okay, oops, yeah, it went too far. 
Okay, so different services have different roles and slightly different cultures, and there is some friendly inter-service rivalry. Um, but, and in fact, one of the, uh, the sayings is that Navy navigates by the stars, Army sleeps under the stars, Air Force never goes anywhere unless it's five stars. So I ask you, who makes a sensible decision? And in fact, I did a bit of research on this, and uh, the constitution of the various arms of the Defence Force, as you can see, is about 50% Army, uh, about 25% Navy and Air Force. But when you look at anaesthetists, it's 49% Air Force. So what does that say about anaesthetist uh, culture as well, um, I ask you? Very sensible people, I would say. But we combine together so that the, sum is, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts, and we call that being joint, so being in a joint organisation. But we're also talk about being one defence, because a lot of civilians work in defence as well. So there's cultures, cultures upon cultures and cultures within the overarching culture. And the health culture is also part of that as well. Now, how do, how do people view serv uh, health services in the military? Well, there's almost, because of that putting people in harm's way, there's almost a um, total of duty of care, a paternalistic approach to looking after our people. They get free medical and dental, which is seen as a condition of service. So one of the reasons people join and stay is because they're looked after. Uh, we're also very much a hot topic when it comes to reputation because health is an emotive issue, as we know. The health personnel tend to adopt the cultures of the single service they work in with a health flavour, but one of the differences is the way, as you can see from the Red Cross, and maybe the hat as well, um, we're non-combatants. Um, so we work in a fighting organisation, but uh, we're not war fighters, and that sets us a little bit apart. Um, so what do we do? David sort of talked a little bit about what we do and where my role fits in, but we're about supporting ADF capability in that mission, and we do that by being a combat enabler. The, the cap part of the capabilities that bind the militaries together to maximise the, the um, operational effectiveness of defence. And we do it in that cycle there, and we, we start in the garrison environment back home in Australia by preparing and maintaining fitness. When people deploy into the overseas or on a ship, uh, then healthcare is normally provided by um, the single services, but my organisation, Joint Health Command or JHC, also enables that. And then when they come back from fighting or deploying, then we involved in rehabilitation recovery to get them back to maximum fitness to go through that cycle again. So that's an important part of our role, but it's not the only part. The other part is that we care for our people. And we do that even if they don't get back into that cycle, or even if it takes them a couple of years to get back to fitness, we look after them, we rehabilitate them, but if they're not able to return to full service, then we also help transition them out into the civilian environment and out, out to the Department of Veterans Affairs. So our mission is therefore to, we've got to sound a bit worried, to create a joint health effect to enable ADF capability and care for our people. And our vision to be able to do that is that we're trusted to care. And I'll talk a little bit more about how we got to that later on. Just to give you an idea of the health system quickly, there are two parts. There's the garrison health system, as I mentioned. That's the bit I command. On-base primary health care, physio, psychologists, dentists, we run all of that. Um, we also buy services from the outside um, health system through a, an ADF health services contract currently with Medibank Health Solutions. And we also have interactions with Department of Veterans Affairs. But it's very much connected to the deployed operational health system. So it's a continuous cycle through. As I said, um, we, there is integral health support to the three services, but very often we join together, particularly if we're going to put this beast into the field, which is a uh, role to enhance, which is a full surgical ICU capability hospital, then almost invariably you'll find that members of all three services get together to create that capability. And so my role, as I said, is to be commander joint health, but also overarching that whole defence health system to make sure the whole system glues together, to make sure that everybody's got the right kit, the right skills, the right policy governance, all of these things in place. So I like to say I command this bit and then I coordinate and influence this bit. So it's a big job, but uh, obviously I like it or I wouldn't still be here. Um, so just a little bit about those elements as well. Oh, sorry, I just say, so the, the stars there, where do anaesthetists fit in? We can't have a deployable role to e without anaesthetists. So we rely on you folks very heavily in that space. But of course, we also have people undergoing procedures, having problems, uh, needing support in the, in the civilian environment, and that's, we can contract that through that contract. And I'm sure many of you have seen our people. Uh, this gives you a number. It, the numbers don't actually add up, but I noticed this morning. But 
There's about, um, overall, there's about 76 uh, anaesthetists and intensivists uh, that work for us. Of that, about 11 are um, yeah, full-time and the rest are in the reserves. And the full-time people work in a variety of hospitals, as you can see there. So it's very likely that there is an ADF uh, um, individual working in your hospital around the country. Uh, in Garrison, it's all about holistic healthcare. It's a complete system in parallel with the civilian system. Our folks don't, we don't pay Medicare levy. We don't have uh, Medicare. So we pay for all of that and we give free healthcare based on what's needed, operational requirements, and what you would get under Medicare, but we don't make people pay the gap. So it's a pretty good deal. We focus on fitness for duty. So there's a lot of occupational health as well as personal healthcare. We have a mixed workforce of, of uh, defence force, public servants and contractors, and we serve two customers. We serve the patients, but we also serve command. So we like actually have to be command responsive and patient centred because we're connected to operational capability. So we need to help them maintain the fitness of their pe personnel, but also assess the risk when they're not fit to deploy. We also have, oops, sorry. We also have a few areas of uh, specialist health around the country. Um, including our Chair of Military Medicine and Surgery, um, Professor Michael Reid, um, uh, to provide us uh, research and, uh, and other um, elements within our health system. And of course, then we have the deployable health system where, as I said, the assets are owned by the single services. They're sent over into harm's way to protect and treat our troops. I maintain technical control. And of course, um, it's uh, made up of full-time health personnel plus the reserve, including specialists. It looks something like this. It's a completely connected system from a role one, we call it, point of injury care, to a role two, which has might be on, on the, in the field, on the ground, or in a ship, uh, in both cases. Um, that provides a bit more resuscitative capability. I said deployed uh, role two enhanced with a surgical capability. We don't have what's called a role three, which the Americans and some of our allies do, which is a, a, almost a complete hospital with a lot of subspecialties in the field, but then we have role four. It's obviously a hospital familiar to those of you in Adelaide um, that we, we evacuate people through that chain and we do that by having our aeromedical evacuation capability to take people to the next level of care. Um, we have a lot of uh, roles, as I said, it's mainly about treating the ADF, but we also treat a lot of civilians, particularly in humanitarian type roles, and we do provide support across that spectrum from war fighting right down to domestic disaster relief as well. So that's what we do and that's what the military culture is all about. What I'm going to talk about now is a little bit on cultural change and at the strategic level. And I thought I'd start off by giving a bit of a feel for how defence has changed since I've come into the organisation. And this, uh, I put this together a few years ago and um, unbelievably, back in 1969, which is in my lifetime, well and truly, uh, uh, that was the first time women were allowed to stay after they got married. Um, it wasn't until 1974 that pe women could keep serving after they became pregnant. So in my lifetime, we have made amazing advances in the way we treat women in Defence Force. As you can see there, um, we've gradually opened more and more positions. We have uh, women air crew, um, we have now, um, this, the PES thing is employment standards based, so you, you, you actually have a fitness test based on what you have to do in your job but versus you all have to carry big packs and be, you know, big infantry soldiers. So we've really um, made big advancements but even in, in, in 2012 where, um, I'll talk about what happened after that, we, only 14% of the Defence Force was women. So a lot of advancements but still a ways to go. The other thing that's changed a lot is LGBTI. It was only in 1992 that we revoked Monty Python's rules one, three, five, and seven, as you can see there. <coughs> I was in the UK at the time. They couldn't believe we'd revoked these rules and did their best impressions of Monty Python. But it, again, in my lifetime, we've gone through from a, a doctor colleague of mine who was told to leave while he, because he was gay. Um, and there were investigations and it was very much underground right through, and, and in, in, two, right in the 2000s, I actually, we, as you can see, we, we um, opened much before the UK and the US. And in fact, in, when I was on exchange with the US, I had to do a uh, mandatory training course on homosexual awareness, and I still have the certificate, which is very good. Uh, and um, 
In 2002, my partner, I had a partner, but um, we were regarded as, I was regarded as single, so I didn't get the entitlements. But then de facto came in, transgender policy, and now we march in uniform in Mardi Gras, and I'm like, proud to say I led the first contingent in Mardi Gras marching in uniform. So we've come a long way, uh, which is great. And what I like to say, especially to some of our people who think we should move, be moving a, a bit faster, we have moved with the times and we always end up on the right side of history but we're still a bit male, Anglo and old fashioned and bad stuff has happened. And that particularly came to a head in the Skype incident in April 2011 at, at our, uh, our academy. And this became a real catalyst to launch us into cultural change. <coughs> it's, it's, it um, generated a whole heap of reviews. One of the most significant there is the Broderick Review, the reviews of treatment of women and uh, a whole heap of things um, that ge was generated from this one incident. And the change that's come has been good. We created this thing called Pathway to Change, Evolving Defence Culture. But, and, and out of that, we set up a Defence Abuse Response Task Force for those people who had, um, had, had you know, historic cases of, of abuse within the Defence Force. We set up a Sexual Misconduct Prevention Response Office for people have, who are currently serving having problems. We did unacceptable behaviour surveys, command-led mandated conversations, <coughs> mandatory training about these issues, and also adopting of white ribbon. But a lot of this wouldn't have occurred, I don't think, if it hadn't been for some reinforcement. Because we, the actual incident that occurred was one, a one-off incident, and many of us looked and went, that's, that's a kid who's only just come into, or kids who'd only just come into the military. They're at a uni. Is what went on, and the, the, the issue was that they filmed, um, allegedly filmed on Skype while one of them was having sex with a girl and the others were watching. <clears throat> was that really saying our whole defence culture was a problem? Or was that just what young people do? And so I think there was a bit of a, yeah, okay, yeah, we've got to do these things. But things changed then once we started down that path. And one of them was the Jedi Council you may have heard of which again was about sharing um, you know, sexually explicit activity and preying on women, et cetera. And then our chief of army at the time, David Morrison, he, he put a, a video up that went viral on social media. And I know many of you would have seen it. And basically the message was, the standard you walk past is the standard you accept. That was a powerful moment of change. The other powerful moment of change was out of that Defence Abuse Re um, Response Task Force, we developed this process called restorative engagements, which is if somebody had been previously abused by defence, um, they would, if they, if they wanted to, could sit down with a senior officer in defence and tell them what happens. And it was those lived experience, and I've been involved in them myself, those lived experiences by our most senior people in defence force made them realise that, yeah, no, this wasn't a one-off occurrence. We had a cultural problem in defence and we needed to fix it. <clears throat> and from that moment on, it didn't just become a reputation piece, like because the, the newspapers were going crazy, it became a genuine commitment to look after our people, create a, wait, a safe work for, for, uh, workplace. But it also became about, well, we want our you know, mothers and fathers to give their kids to serve Australia in the future. We want them to know it's a safe workforce. But we also realised that this is about getting the best out of our people, the best of the best, so that we can do our job uh, and, uh, in the field. And part of this is also was you, you can have change, but you, uh, you need to change what the Defence Force looks like a little bit to better represent Australia and also to change the culture. And diversity has been a big focus out of this as well. Our female representation has now gone from 14 to 20 per cent. Still small steps, but all positions are open. If you're fit enough, you've got the skills to do the job, you can do any job, infantry soldier, fighter pilot, anything you want to do. And not all militaries are there yet. Uh, it's very multi trying to get more multicultural and multi-faith. We have um, uh, both uh, Islamic, uh, Jewish, Buddhist um, padres, um, if you like. Now they're not all just Christian padres. We're uh, emphasising the indigenous aspect as well. And of course, LGBTI rights have increased as, uh, and as well as transgender, etc. But there's been a lot of backlash, which is quite fascinating to me. Most of you would say, wow, we've come a long way. These were the sort of headlines. What's with it? 
Um, and we've now come to this position where we're, you know, we're accepting, we've realised, we've mistaken, moved on, but now the papers are abusing us for it. We're too PC. We've lost our way. There's an implication there that we're ignoring people with PTSD because we're more interested in gay rights. You can see some of the, the, um, the cartoons there. This, this poor young chap from the Navy, he uh, painted his pinky pink for a publicity com campaign about 100 days of change in respecting women, and he all, all of a sudden became the poster boy for political correctness, which is really quite sad. And, um, you know, it, it's, the media has got a lot, I guess, got a lot to answer for. I'm sorry if there's any media here present today. But, um, you know, we can't get some of this right. But I think we have got it right. And I think what has been the, the way this has changed is that top-down leadership. I was privileged to sit next to our former Vice Chief of the Defence Force, uh, Admiral Griggs, when he was in Senate Estimates, basically defending at why we allow transgender people to serve and why we will actually pay for their treatment. Um, to, you know, uh, to continue to serve. Because we invest money with them, they're our capability, they're our people, we look after them. So it's been clear and authentic messaging. Just putting re reviews out there, just telling people to do stuff doesn't work. It has to be authentic. And it's been authentic, it's been authentic that it enhances our capability, but also that it's the right thing to do. And I think most of us feel a great deal of pride in our response. There are still, obviously, not everybody would agree, but I think we've come an awful long way. We're not done yet, though. We're relaunching Pathway to Change. Um, we sat around these big focus groups. What, what words are we going to use? You know, what's going to be our values and everything else? And one of the, my colleagues just said, well, I think it's simple. There's one, word, one phrase you need, don't be a dick. And I think, actually, that probably sums it up. And be nice to people, just like your mother told you. So th this is basically where we're at now. Um, we're, we're continuing to look at how we can you know, make it a better and better culture. And I was speaking to once a person who spent five years on that Defence Abuse Response Task Force just the other day, and, and her words were eternal vigilance, because there are still bad things that happen. But as long as we're there to respond and uh, do the right thing by people, um, then we, we're moving in the right direction. The other big thing that's changed since I've come in is the culture around mental health. Oh, sorry, I, I skipped ahead. Um, so how does health get involved in this cultural change? Well, we actually um, boost up the numbers because we have a large percentage of women. Um, we also put out the world's first military health policy on gender dysphoria, and a lot of other nations have now come to us. It's very simple. It's based on evidence. It's non-discriminatory. And as I said, it's based on operational capability. Gender dysphoria is a medical illness. Uh, it's, um, it needs to be treated and we treat in accordance with what people can get under Medicare, under the MSBS. Um, so this is so, this, the thing about non-discriminatory, risk-based approach to fitness to duty, and we have changed some of our policy. For instance, with HIV, it was a blanket, you can't deploy, you've got to get out. Now, of course, treatments have, uh, have improved, so you now can deploy if you're HIV positive. Um, the, the, the careful thing we've had to do sometimes is um, some people th uh, try to medicalise some of these issues. And an example recently was we have two cadets who are non-binary gender. Um, that's not a medical issue. That's a social issue. But we can help educate people, help people understand as we go through this journey because uh, there, you know, there are still challenges to be done. So now I'll get on to mental health. Oh, so I just want to mention the Jackie Lamb. One, I guess I don't know if it's a highlight or low light of my career was sitting opposite... Uh, Jackie Lambie and Senate Estimates explaining why we were doing transgender policy and having her abuse me and saying, that's, uh, troops don't want this to happen. I thought, I think that's a win, actually, but who knows. So mental health. Mental health we've paid a lot of attention to over the last few years, and uh, we have been through so much change. We've um, uh, done lots of reviews, um, uh, st new strategies, um, policies, plans, research in that space. And uh, it's been quite a big investment since 2009 in the health-led um, push to, to improve mental health in the ADF. We've invested a lot. We've, we've strengthened our workforce and trained our workforce. We've improved access. And I could do a whole lecture on just all of these bits and pieces. Um, and so we've put a significant amount of effort into it. And as you'll see later, we're actually getting some good results, but again, that's not what the media's been saying. So there is a common theme here. A lot of this is driven by external perceptions. 
Um, so the, the media would tell you we've got terrible problems with mental health and we're not doing anything about it. Look at this poll. Do you think the ADF should take more responsibility for the health and welfare of its personnel? 97% said yes, and yet we provide total health care <laughs> for, uh, for free. So this, I guess, it was a problem for us, and it's one that we've been working on over the last few years, because looking at those headlines and looking at the, the, the imagery that comes out is all very negative, and it actually undermines the trust in our health services. It also, people start to think, well, maybe it's true that if you've got a mental health problem, that's it, your career's over. Uh, it's career suicide to present with it. It reinforces the stigma, the negativity and the barriers to care, and it means people present late, and then it almost becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. They present late, complex case, it then is difficult to treat, and they do end up not being able to serve, and they have very difficult transitions to civilian life and, even, and have very difficulty, a great difficulty in the veteran space. They hide their problems, they seek healthcare outside. Some might say, well, that's okay, they're getting healthcare. But if we don't know what healthcare they're getting, then we don't know what risk it is to deploy them into an, a, 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 an environment. It also is a problem because it's not documented, they go to the Department of Veterans Affairs, they put in a claim, there's nothing to prove their claim. And it also, of course, it has a reputational effect. So what we looked at is saying we, we, we don't just need to improve services and look at the medical side of this. What we need is a whole of defence response. And this is what we have been doing over the last few years, but it's cold, cold, culminated in this um, mental health strategy that we released last year. And as you can see, it's not just about health. It's about leadership at all levels. It's about setting the right workplace and culture, looking at, at positive attitudes and behaviours, and being alert and aware that there are people serving alongside of you who, who are having mental health problems. It's also about empowerment of the individual to try and make them understand that really healthcare is there, you, you need to accept it, and that bumper sticker, the earlier you present the better, but it's never too late. As well as having the responsive programs and policies and treatment services that we do, and as well as increasing the trust and confidence in our system that they're, we're there to help them. And I'll talk a little bit more about trust a bit later on. And this has had a, uh, a major impact. Um, the evidence says we really have made a difference over the last few years. Uh, so a whole heap of, we get reviewed and studied to death and many of them are saying that, that mental health awareness has cr increased markedly um, across the ADF. And, I, and I, my feeling is that as well. In fact, some people have said to me, there's too much awareness. Um, I'm not sure that that's quite how I look at it. Our services, when we do reviews, are rated as, as good, fair to excellent, by 80% of people. So they know we've got good services. First responder agencies are looking to us, borrowing in the products, the training and everything we do, because they recognise they've got a problem as well. And when we look at, compare our, um, some, in some of our studies to civilian markers, Full-time ADF members with mental health problems seek care within the first 12 months and many within the three months and have higher rates of satisfaction with services compared with their civilian counterparts. What I also skipped over accidentally was the suicide rate. For serving members, men, because the numbers of women are small, our, our suicide rate is 51% lower than the general population age matched. Now that's not something you read in the newspapers. It shows we've got the mechanisms in place, but it's not just the health mechanisms, it's all the other culture around that. And 47, I think it's 47% lower for reserve. The sad news is it's about 18% higher for those who've left, particularly in the young age group. And that under 30 uh, veteran population is the one we're looking at at the moment, is what is going on in that space. But while they're in defence within our care, that is lower. And I'm hearing from my psychologists around the country that people are presenting earlier now. So their work rate has gone up, but they're not getting as many complex cases. So more people coming in the door, but not keeping them as long because we're winning that battle of um, awareness and uh, early identification. So that's three big... Um, uh, in fact, I'll just go back for a sec. That's three big um, cultural changes that have happened at the strategic level of defence. What I want to talk now about, just to finish off, is 
some of the cultural change that I'm trying to be doing, have been doing since I got into this job, um, because some of it does sort of uh, interact with some of the other bits and pieces, but I think it also illustrates how you go about changing culture, both your own culture and the culture around you to, as to how you're perceived. So for me, um, before I went into this job, the great thing about the military is it does give you a lot of post-nominals, as you said, David. It actually prepares you to do your job. So my preparation to do the job was to go to Harvard Business School for two months to do the advanced management program. That's their motto. We educate leaders who make a difference in the world. It's very aspirational. Their old motto was um, to educate people to make a decent profit decently, um, which I, quite, I actually quite like. I mean, it's, it's transparent. Um, so they sent me to this place, this, this, you know, hallowed halls of learning, and they told us all, about all sorts of things, leadership. We had this guy, Jack Welsh, come and talk to us, your former CEO of GE. You know, if you want unconditional love, go to your mother, tough love with your employee, all sort of good stuff, um, to prepare me to go into the job. So I guess what I took away was, OK, how am I going to approach my job? What is my strategy going to do? But before I do my strategy, what is my burning platform? What are the issues... The good thing about a burning platform is it, in, it engages people, it, it, it motivates them to change. So in December 2015, I, I took over the role from my predecessor and I started to look at, well, what's going to be my burning platform? And I realised I've got a lot of platforms. Um, it's obviously deliver healthcare and do the operational capability bit, but also get better at managing our business. That's what my boss told me. Got a bit better at, at managing resources. The mental health st stuff. We've got a lot of reputational issues. We've got a multi-billion dollar health contract that we're negotiating at the moment. We're building health, 12 new health facilities. We're building the future through health, uh, operational capability equipment and e-health. We've got the veterans health issue. All of these things, what is my burning platform? And, and the conclusion I came to was actually our burning platform was our culture. Because without that, nothing else would happen. And there was a good case for cultural change. The picture there isn't me but it is how we were perceived at times during our, um, our creation. So the case for cultural change, we need to do more work in mental health, and I mentioned that, get back trust from our people. But we also had to change the way people interacted and looked at Joint Health Command and the way we looked at ourselves. We'd been through a lot of change since we were stood up in 2008. We'd We'd um, gone from having single service health facilities, and on some bases there are up to nine different health centres on one base, uh, consolidating those and taking over control of them from the single services. We'd also put in a new contract, we'd put in a new e-health system, the first national e-health system in Australia. So we'd done a lot of good stuff, but it wasn't always perceived as change for good. Um, each of the services had their own... They tried to dismantle us, quite frankly, in the early days. The former Chief of Air Force called us an evil centralised agency, hence the photo. Um, and our personnel in Joint Health Command felt very changed, fatigued and under attack. And in fact, I went to a health centre just before I took over the job and said, what's one thing you think I should do in my new job? And they said, don't change anything, which is, which is sad because if we don't change, we don't, we can't, we don't survive. So, um, the vibe wasn't good. There was a lack of trust, as you can see. We're outside the circle of trust. Um, command didn't think we were supporting them properly. There was no sense of the, of the joint health. It was almost an us and them between deployable health and garrison health. Our people had become very defensive, a lot of learned helplessness and very poor morale. So, my strategy, therefore, was to say, well, it's actually not about strategy, it's about culture, as Peter Drucker would say. Uh, culture eats strategy for breakfast. So I needed to focus on most of the iceberg, tackle our culture, the broader military culture, etc., and then the programs or the deliverables, all those other things on the list, would take care of themselves or would be attacked in a way that we could get some, um, some real traction on them. So it was cultural reset, uh, define and create a sense of joint health, improve morale, etc., etc. Um, so improve morale internally, but also improve customers' understanding and improve the support we gave to customers. And it was cultural change not just to make us feel better, but to do our job better and support our command better. So I started on some simple stuff, mission and vision. So these were our mission and vision statements before. And I went to our Australian Military Medicine Conference and I stood up there before I came into the job. I said, so who can tell me the mission statement? Nada. 
Who can tell me the vision? Not a peep. No one knew it. So we simplified it. And we simplified it to the one you saw earlier on to actually explain what we do. Not waffle words. Make it really clear what we do every day. And our vision, because trust was such an issue, that would be our vision, to be trusted. If we can be trusted, those communication problems go away, our effectiveness go, uh, gets better, etc. So we did this, we, we started communicating it, we built those slides that, that you saw earlier on about how we fit into the broader organisation, created that sense of purpose and communicated it constantly. Going out to all our health centres, creating posters, going out and challenging people. So what's our mission and what's our vision? And people, or most of them, can tell you what it is now. Um, also looked at values. Now, the good thing about the military is we've got all these different cultures, we've got all these different... Everybody's got their own values. They're all good. You can see there you've got the Navy, the Army, the Air Force and the public service values. But I wanted to create something that was meaningful for our people. And what we came up with, it's my five Ps, sort of. It's, uh, it's positivity, pride, professionalism, passion and empathy. Uh, I wanted to make it pathos, but it didn't work as well. So we created this because this is what we felt that our health providers, and the, and the big thing we'll, there was the empathy. We wanted our people to start like treating their customers um, you know, with respect, with professionalism, all these sort of things. So we, we settled on those values, my team and I, and uh, we then reinforced those values. That was one side of the coin you saw there. There's my other Surgeon General's coin. So we started actually trying to reward our people more. We, we can get, we've got medals that we can give people, we've got commendations that I can give people, but I've also got my coin. And the coin is, as you can see there, presented to people often at lower ranks who don't get a lot of rewards, just to say, you're living our values. You're the sort of person that when people come into this health centre, they can go, that's what Joint Health Command is all about. So we, we created this, this um, new award that I can only give out personally, you can't buy it on eBay, you have to be given by me to create a sense of value and it not only has an effect of the person getting it, but if you get the person right, everybody goes, of course, they're the person in the health centre that really makes us all feel good about ourselves. So, and I've given it to contractors, I've given it to all sorts of people to emphasise that one team. Even um, on, a, on exercise there, you can see the one in the middle. Uh, that was an army guy, doesn't even work for me. But he's doing a good job in defence health. So I gave him my coin. So that's the internal stuff, the external stuff, and, and that was also about focusing on our customers as well. But the external stuff was the broader customer engagement. So we actually, within the first couple of months of me going to the job, we... Um, uh, actually did a, uh, a, a management activity where we went to command at all levels and said, do you trust us? Are we transparent? Do you, we meet your needs? And funnily enough, they said, yeah, not really. But it really didn't surprise us. But what it did is it opened a discussion. And it opened an ability to create a framework of communication. And it opened, changed the language from not, we need to have a relationship, but this is a partnership. We're all here for the same purpose. I can't do my job. If I can't do my job, you can't do your job. So you've got to help me do my job and I've got to help you do your job as well. So we, we did that. We, we have had a patient satisfaction survey, so we're asking people every year what they think of our health services. And we changed this, this idea around to be this command-focused, member-centred, recovery-oriented health services to, to help people understand that we were more than just a GP practice. And we developed this term, customer-centric reform. Um, we, what it was really about was to sort of change people's attitude to us. And I, I developed this hierarchy, kind of Maslow's a smart hierarchy of, of uh, excellence in healthcare. Um, but it's really going from just a quality and safe uh, healthcare system to one that's customer-focused, then one, therefore, that is trusted, that valued, and then we've got customers actually engaging in their own healthcare. And we've done quite a few things in that space to uh, try to improve the way people look at their healthcare and also improve the services. Even things like family sensitive practice now. We don't look after families, but families are part of our team. So how do we engage more with families and support that aspect as well? We've also made some commitments, command compact, which is basically commanders, this is what we will do for you. 
and also our pledge to our patients what we will do for you. So we made statements and we said to them, here's our complaint system. If we don't live up to them, tell us about it. Don't just grizzle. Don't call us an evil centralised agency. Tell us the problem so we can fix it because that is what we are um, trying to achieve. We've improved our reporting as well. That's helped a lot and that comes from our e-health system. And we've also peppered the service newspapers with positive stories. And in, in 2016-17, we had 16 positive art articles just in Army News alone, and there's service, all, each service has its own paper, about healthcare. So people are starting to think, oh, it's not all bad. Actually, it's kind of good. So it's almost subtle messaging. Um, and it's actually been successful. We have seen a, a, an improvement in morale and a sense of purpose, a better understanding of our people of the strategic situation. And we've seen these values, people know what they are, people understand if they show them, they'll be supported and rewarded. So we've really seen also that we've, we've actually run this stupid shit st um, stuff campaign, uh, basically saying to our people, what's the stuff that you're doing that really doesn't make any sense? And how can you do it better? So we've actually now got buy-in from our people to improve the organisation as well. And we made our tenth, had our 10th birthday in August. A lot of people didn't think we'd get that far, but we really, uh, we had a good party and we've really shown how much we've come, uh, how far we've come in that time um, from, from an internal perspective. Uh, externally, this is a new Vice Chief of the Defence Force. He's a very happy man when I opened a new health centre for him earlier in the year. But our event, general view of health services now has changed. We're not under attack. Uh, our customer relationships are very good. I have direct relationships with the Deputy Service Chiefs and I, I challenge them and say, tell me what the problems are we'll fix it, and we, we do fix it, which obviously reinforces that. So we've got satisfied officers. We've got a better sense of One Health across the whole organisation too, the deployed and garrison space, and as I said, early engagement in mental health issues. And we've now got, um, at one stage, a lot of our health people didn't want to come and work in Joint Health Command, but we've actually got high quality people coming in now, understanding that part of their career now is delivering healthcare in the garrison space, as well as the sexy stuff on operations. We've still got a few challenges. We still haven't really got past this idea that we give free medical and dental just because we like people, that it actually is about fitness for duty. Um, so we're doing some work on that. People complain that our health services aren't very good. Well, then when they get out, they go, oh, actually, they were pretty good. We can walk into any health centre, ADF health centre anywhere in Australia and be seen on the same day. It's not bad. Um, we, get, we, we actually have, uh, through our contract, uh, prioritisation of our patients to, to get surgery they need and everything else. It's not bad, but th they t I think it's a platinum card service. But, uh, you know, I think sometimes we, when you create this sense of it, when it's free and it's seen as an entitlement, it's not valued and taken for granted. And that leads to criticism of us, but also means people want to get their money's worth out of free healthcare by not actually taking responsibility for their own healthcare in some cases. And even in some cases, almost demanding that we have a, you know, well, I've hurt my ankle, so you better operate on it, fix it, rather than trying some other techniques. So what we're trying to do now is, is reframe this to saying we want people to be proactive and stay healthy. Um, the healthcare is there, but it's so much better if you don't have to use it by looking after yourself, so we're doing some education there, and also education on this whole idea of career suicide, the medical downgrade, and understanding that it's not punishment, it's about assessing risk and whether you are fit to go and do your job in various environments. Um, we've also been educating them, we've used the Choosing Wisely campaign, a lot of you will be familiar with, which is the five questions to ask your doctor. So we've put them up in our health centres uh, centers as well to start saying, look, it's free healthcare, but sometimes you don't need a surgical procedure. Sometimes you, you, know, you don't need the test. Ask, because we don't have the levers of money, you ask yourself, do I really need this, this uh, uh, treatment? So we're trying to educate in that way. And the other thing we've done, when I put those two other posters up, some of the commanders said, well, where's, where's the thing that says what, how patients should treat you? So we've put this one up. What are your responsibilities? And these are going up now uh, across our health centres as well. So what have been the keys to our success? Well, it's really been a multi-frontal assault, but I think it started with redefining ourselves, our narrative, our sense of purpose, 
at, with the simple mission and visions and values and then communicating that across the whole organisation. Uh, I think the idea of the two-customer approach really resonated with people and the partnerships piece and chipping away at the messaging. This is just a, the most, one of the most recent issues of Navy news. There's a whole spread on Joint Health Command and what we're doing and caring for the fighters. So positive messages, uh, messages in that space. So lessons learned, I mean, we're still on that journey, I think, and we will be, I think, for some time. We want to go from customer engagement to engaged customers, as per that other di um, di diagram, who value their healthcare. But the other thing I found interesting is like that iceberg picture, tackling the soft stuff, changing the way we're seen and changing the way we see ourselves has actually produced some hard results. So we've now got total support of the senior leadership. If we go to them and say, we want to do this new thing like mental health screening, enhanced mental health screening um, for people. So not just when they deploy, but you know, every, every year when they come into the health centre, they do a mental health screen, which is actually... It's not just box ticking, it actually starts a conversation about mental health. But we need more money. More money is given. We don't have to fight for it, and that's a change. We've also been given more roles and responsibilities. That's not always a good thing, but it shows that the organisation has trust in us at the strategic level. What we've also found, though, is that um, although we've been focused on internally our sense of purpose, we've been focused on how we treat our customers, not how we treat each other so much. So we've almost come full circle back to the pathway to change thing. And we're looking now at how we can empower our people a bit more um, and how we can actually have look at our workplace internally and our own health, as uh, we were talking about with that wellbeing thing earlier on, how we can uh, make that change to mature the process even further. And I'll just put this, I don't expect anybody to read this, but this is a slide I put up of priorities earlier in the year. And we, we decided, because we were going to focus on our people this year, we put this up and our mission and vision, we'd have a gallery day where people put sticky notes up about what they thought of things. And the feedback was, oh, so it's all about Garrison Health, is it? And look, Garrison Health is so big, it's pushing down on all the others and they're not as important. I thought, that's not what I was trying to communicate. So what I've done is try to put a whole sort of piece together on how we are all connected to that end point of making sure our warfighters are fit to do the job and also how our veterans uh, are, are as fit as possible when they leave us as well. So it's, it's, it's really useful. You think you're communicating at the strategic level, but you've got to ground truth it at that lower level as well. And we also um, have now come up with a values compact. So still our values, but then what are the behaviours that demonstrate that, those values? And these we developed from those gallery days, both within the headquarters, but at the 59 health facilities around Australia as well, about how do you want to be treated and how should you treat others. So it's a never-ending quest. So questions for you, coming to the end. Um, the, um, I think, it's a, I think the, maybe one of the purposes of, of why I was invited to speak here is because I think you guys are going through some cultural changes and some looking at yourselves and how others perceive you as well. So I guess these are questions I don't have the answers to. What is your culture? How do people view you? And how do you see yourselves? This quote came from, uh, from uh, um, uh, our uh, uh, Kester Brown, I believe, the most mysterious medical practitioners. Do you want to be mysterious uh, men of mystery and women of mystery? Or do you want people to know better what you do? Do you support and value each other? And I think that's the initiative that you were talking about, David. Um, and what influence do you have on a broader clinical culture? And what is your sense of purpose? And uh, I... I um, my brother Jamie sent me the strategic plan of the college, and I know this isn't the college, but I thought there was a lot of things in here that actually are sort of the things I was talking about. You know, goal one is about identity and, and, and who, who you are, and goal four is about supporting the workforce and wellbeing. And I think the identity is interesting because I did Google opinions of anaesthetists, and, of course, what came up as the first question are anaesthetists doctors? There you go. I, I, I had no idea that that would be the case. And I, we know that there are studies which show that not a lot of um, people know that. But um, I also have never met anyone who wants to have surgery without anaesthesia. So I think actually you're more important and people think you're more important than you think they think you are, if that makes sense. So, and also you're critical to ADF capability. I think that's a real positive. And of course, there's things that you bring, that you lead in, in the health profession, 
and equality and safety are just some of the things and some of the themes of, of, this, um, of this conference, where you are leaders and you can teach the rest of the medical profession a thing or two. Uh, now, I know there's a lot of controversy about changing names, so I don't have an opinion on that. Um, I, uh, I can never say anesthesiologist without sound, with an American accent, but I understand that there are sensitivities, and I did read the fact that ologist makes you sound better, but I don't think that the surgeons are changing to surgeologists, but, you know, there you go. But um, I don't have an opinion on that, but I guess the question is, do you just change your name, or do you change your name because you want to use this as a launching pad to change your culture, the perceptions of yourselves and also of the other people's perceptions of you. Um, another question, though, to pose, are you really connecting with your customers? So I've got the choosing wisely five questions to ask your doctor. Then I've got the college um, for clinicians and consumers. But how many consumers understand any of the words that are up there? Seriously. So, you know, if you really want to look at that, what are five questions your customers could be asking about to their anaesthetists? Might be a bit more powerful. So, in conclusion, I think you've got my view that culture is very important, but it's not just for its own sake. It's not just because it makes you feel good. It actually underpins everything you do. And if you try and do a whole heap of things as we're trying to do without changing and looking at your culture, then you're doomed to failure. Cultural change is difficult and it doesn't happen overnight. You need to keep chipping away, but it doesn't have to be complex. You can start with simple things. And of all of those things, I think a sense of purpose is, is perhaps the most important thing. Leadership is crucial. And I should say here, this is not all about me. Leadership yourself and your team. This wouldn't have worked if I didn't have total buy-in from my executive team and, and the leadership throughout my organisation. But you need to get out there, you, as a picture there, get out to the health centres in, in our, my case, talk them through what's in, where I see us, what I see our sense of purpose, why, why our vision, why our mission, get them to, uh, to uh, also embrace it. Focus both internally and externally, I think that was important and a key to our success. But as I said, you need to keep chipping away, you need to persist, it does take a lot of time and our journey is not complete. I finish up in my role at the end of next year. There's still a lot of things I want to do to change, uh, to, to move us down that path. And I know when I'm finished, it won't be finished. But I've got a leadership team, hopefully, who will continue that into the future. So uh, I think that brings us to the, uh, the end of the, uh, of the presentation. Um, it's, uh, as I said, been a privilege to uh, come and have a chat to you today. I've already met some old friends and and, uh, and veterans of Rwanda who, with really bad haircuts, haven't I, Roger? <laughs> um, sorry, old, old joke that's been going on for 30 or 20 odd years now. Um, but it's, uh, it's a pleasure and uh, thanks very much for listening. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Tracy, for an uh, interesting and stimulating uh, presentation. Uh, I think it's left me with thinking about a lot of things. Um, as part of the uh, Kester Brown uh, pre presentation, you get a copy of Kester's book, Catalyst, Medical Memoirs of a World Anaesthetist, which I think will broaden your experience about Kester. And to go with your collection of coins, we also have the Kester Brown uh, Lecture Medal. So. Uh, Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, as the final part of the formalities today, I would like to invite Greg Luck up uh, onto the stage, uh, the representative, the, the exhibitor's representative, uh, just to talk about the ex exhibition uh, that we have here at the conference. Thank you, Greg. Good morning, everybody. Um, on behalf of all the companies that are represented here, um, we would like to invite you to join us over the next couple of days. Um, every year, we've got new innovations, new products coming to market. Um, these are to help you better support your, um, your customers and patients to um, get a better patient experience. Um, so we'd like to invite you to, to spend some time with us, come down, 
have a bit of fun with us. Uh, we're looking forward to, to, to spending this time with you. And I now declare the um, exhibition open for business. Thank you. Um, with that, I invite you to uh, join us all for morning tea and uh, meet the exhibitors. Uh, thank you very much to the presenters this morning and to Airbus Muscle Smart.